I'm really excited to come up and talk to Brad today and ask him some questions and certainly want to make sure that you have a chance to open up and ask some questions too. But the thing that really fascinates me is um, AI in itself is really cool and sexy and high and you could geek out on it forever. And if you were watching in on the fireside chat sessions um, with uh, Google and OpenAI, you can see really where it's taking us. Um, but to run your business on algorithms and data, that's crazy. It's like out of research and academia and theory, and you can actually do something with it. And it's one thing to play with a model here and there within your business. It's another thing to push that out at scale mm -hmm. and then exponentially expand off of that. So what does that look like? What does that feel like? How do you run that? Is that scary? <laughs> I wouldn't say scary, more <laughs> exciting. Um, and first of all, thank, thanks for, for having me. It's great to be here. I think uh, you know, Stitch Fix is a, is a personal online styling service, and you know, somewhat surprisingly for um, you know, a retailer in, in the fashion industry, data and algorithms and, and AI is really at the heart of our business. And I think um, some of that is due to the, the, the model of retail, uh, of personal styling, and the data that we get from clients. Um, but it's also due to a strategic commitment to essentially using that data to, to, to drive virtually every aspect of our business, from helping stylists do things for clients, and managing inventory and operations. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, there, there are certainly challenges being kind of at the, the, the edge of an algorithmically driven company, but uh, it, uh, more exciting than scary. Good. <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, we had a chance to kind of catch up a little bit a few weeks back as we were preparing and, and hearing a bit about, you know, what, what it looks like for Stitch Fix. You know, they've been up here in the past telling a little bit about the company. There's been some really cool things as they've evolved their data platform to push out at scale. And the question to me was, well, that's really nice, but what was next? And you had like three things that just really stuck out in my mind after we talked. One was all about um, model expansion and reuse. What do we mean by that? Um, the second one was, oops, because of course I need to make sure I have my notes. <laughs> um, the, the other piece of that was, um, you know, where are you going to go from a uh, uh, managing between when do you trust the algorithms, when do you give your business to the algorithms, what is the role of your employees and your people and the humans in the process, what does that mean for the experience of your customer, what does that mean for, for um, you know, running your operations, and then lastly, gaming. <laughs> All right, so let's start with, um, with algorithms you know, the, and model expansion. Like, why, why was this important? What, what were you thinking? Why did you want to move that? So what does it mean? Absolutely. <laughs> so I think uh, this is so much of, so Stitch Fix is a personal styling service. We, uh, you know, send people things that, that we hope they're going to love and make a very literal bet on our recommendations. Um, I, I like to think of it as, you know, a push retail model where we're actually picking things on behalf of our clients and sending them um, to them at their homes. And so all of the magic of the business in essence comes down to being able to send people things that they're going to love and, you know, being able to win that bet um, so that, um, you know, clients are, are delighted by the things that, that we send them and, and, you know, love love to stay with the service. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the unique aspects of, of our model is, the, is how aligned clients are to wanting to, to share feedback. So, um, you know, wanting to tell us this was too big or too small or I love the style or I didn't. Um, in the service of, you know, them, you know, getting, having their styles get to them better and better over time and us being able to make better and better decisions for them in the future. And what that creates is just this wealth of data about every one of our clients and, and you know, about their preferences and uh, the way they've rated different types of inventory. And so one of the things that, you know, we're always working on Stitch Fix is just always getting better at the hard problem of, you know, trying to understand what people are going to like and thinking about using new data and, uh, you know, new algorithms and, you know, uh, machine learning and, and, and AI is, is, you know, really quickly moving and exciting space. And um, so we, we put a lot of effort and, you know, have over 100 data scientists working on um, different ways of just, you know, continuing to improve our understanding of client preferences, both to be more successful in sending people things that they're going to love, but then also managing inventory and operations and even, you know, marketing to, to acquire new clients. And I think that's a really interesting point because one of the things that came out was, 
we often think first, mm -hmm. how do we use algorithms to create personalized mm -hmm. experiences, have great relationships, brand affinities, repeat business, and so on. It's all about, you know, it's, it's the revenue at the end of the day. And yet you're also thinking about, well, some of those same models can actually be used for inventory management and, and the back office operations for meeting those needs and the fulfillment. And a couple of the things that struck me was, you know, being able to have 15% improvement in um, warehouse efficiency and significant mm -hmm. cost savings, for example. I mean, that, that's a pretty big deal. So how do, how do you and your team make the transition for single purpose model deployment and now it's reuse and expansion for other areas. What, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think, uh, so I, I've been at Stitch Vector for about six years now, working working on data and data science. And I think, um, you know, as, as the company has grown and as we've, you know, layered capability on capability and getting more and more ambitious, um, we're starting to find, you know, that the work we've done with one application in mind becomes tremendously valuable in other settings. So I think perhaps the best example of this is, is our core recommendation problem of trying to help a stylist choose what to send to a client. So taking everything that we know about the client and the inventory and, and making those recommendations. And you know that's a, that's a core part of our service. Um, but those same models, those, those same basic algorithmic capabilities of being able to say, this is the type of inventory that somebody is gonna like, allow us to, to think about all of our clients simultaneously in building a portfolio of inventory that they're going to love and help us drive um, buying and, and clearing decisions to constantly optimize our inventory for our clients. And what that translates to as a business is a really efficient model of retail where we're actually, because we have, uh, you know, the luxury of knowing every client to a person um, and, and in some detail, we can actually use all that to build an assortment that we know clients are going to love. Um, and of course, you know, there, there's similar similar applications in other areas of the business where, for example, we have a really good idea of the type of clients who are gonna like our inventory at any point in time. And this helps us to think about, uh, you know, marketing decisions and, um, you know, other, other applications as well. How has it changed the way your data scientists build things and work together? Or do they still stick in their silos and their places of expertise or do they become generalists? It's a great question. So I think, uh, you know, historically, we've had, had had a fairly significant bias for hire, hiring generalists. And I think part of it was that Stitch Fix uh, you know, it is more than just a supervised learning problem, right? So it's a business. And, you know, wanting to hire data scientists who can tackle big, open-ended, ambiguous business questions like, how should we manage our inventory? Uh, you know, not just making a, you know, incrementally better prediction of, uh, of something, though that, you know, is certainly part of what we do. Um, and, and, you know, part, part of that ambiguity and that, you know, business orientation, um, makes people who are generalists or who are good at thinking about statistics and computer science and optimization, all of those things together, um, you know, really effective because they, they can, you know, think about open-ended problems and move among different applications. And as, as our team has grown, I think we found that, you know, that, that culture of having people who can really think holistically about the business and are, um, you know, less oriented um, toward like, you know, a very particular supervised learning problem um, has, has led to a lot of collaboration and, you know, people working together across mm -hmm. silos. Um, you know, one of the shining stars is the platform mm -hmm. that you built as you move to this strategy mm -hmm. of model expansion and reuse. Mm -hmm. Were there things you needed to change, different investments that you had to make? So, so Stitch Fix, uh, within our algorithm team, has a, a data platform team, which is an engineering team that, that works on the, the platform and, and frameworks that our data scientists use to, to, to work with data and to, uh, to, to essentially just practice data science at, at Stitch Fix. And it, it's an interesting, um, you know, really successful approach that we've taken, which, which is really different from some more traditional separation of data scientist and data engineer and platform engineer, where there's a series of handoff between, you know, a scientist coming up with an idea that, you know, then gives it to an engineering team to implement. And, you know, there's a significant dependence and coordination cost to, to having that all broken apart. And so what we've tried to do as much as possible is make it possible for a, a team of data scientists, or in some cases, even a single data scientist, to really holistically own a business problem that they're working on. So, so really deciding what inventory to clear or, or thinking about, um, you know, how to run a certain marketing program and, uh, and to really be able to, to do it all, to, to launch tests, to put their models in production, to, to write their own ETL and to be able to do that without, you know, having a team full of unicorns who are all, you know, fantastic, you know, uh, and, and 
engineers, but also some fantastic data scientists. Um, you know, we we created our data platform team, um, and uh, Jeff Magnuson, the the VP of Algorithm Data Platform, has a great blog post about this. Uh, that's called "Engineers Shouldn't Write ETL." Um, you, sh you should read about it if you want to, you know, hear his philosophy about it. But the idea is essentially to create an engineering team where the uh, you know, the, the mandate, the charter, is really to create tools and frameworks that make data science self-service. So rather than being an implementation team, uh, being a team that, you know, makes it easy to stand up a new API or makes it easy to, to change a dash, dashboard. And so, you know, data scientists who are, you know, not all engineers, but who are, you know, are, are good enough engineers can, can work within that framework and, uh, um, you know, really drive things themselves. And so we found having that investment in platform has been tremendously important. And I think, you know, to your specific question, like as, as you know, things we've worked on have started to mature, having a platform like that has allowed us to fairly easily orient uh, people around building things that are intended for reuse. So if you're building a model that, that predicts, you know, the, the preferences of a client, you know, that's probably useful for somebody who's thinking about what, what inventory that we should buy. And, you know, as you're building that, both in a, you know, a statistical sense, but also in, in an engineering sense, you should intend for it to be reused. And having a platform team that can facilitate that um, has, has made it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Data science, machine learning engineers, data engineers. I mean, we trust the data. We trust the algorithms. We're, we're ready to run our businesses off of that. Um, but sometimes it's scary for employees. How, you know, what, what does that right mix look like for Stitch Fix? I, I loved how you put it in our conversation, balancing art and science. Indeed. Explain yeah. that. So I think one of the most interesting themes about Stitch Fix is is this balance of, of art, art and science. And, and you know, we, we like to say it's art and science, not art versus science. And I think there's a couple places that, that are that are worth mentioning. Um, so one is in the basic, you know, styling. Uh, function of the company. So actually picking the clothes that we send send to clients. And this is something um, that's done done with a combination of algorithmic and human judgment. And so in particular, the way that it works as a stylist is interacting with algorithms and using um, you know our technology that's leveraging all the data that we have to make decisions. And, and what it means is that every single item that we send to clients is actually chosen by a stylist who's, who's working with algorithms. So it's not um, you know, it's not purely algorithmic. And, and what this allows us to do is take advantage of the complementary strengths of, of humans and machines and being able to uh, make better decisions for clients. And, you know, I'm, in, I'm invariably asked when, when I go to conferences, like, well, okay, okay, like, is, is the real ambition here just to, like, get rid of the stylus? And um, it, it's not. And so Stitch Fix has thousands of stylus, and, you know, we found after, you know, years of working on this problem that the value that a human stylist adds and, you know, understanding the intent of a client when they, when they um, write a request note or, or, or share some images on Pinterest is, is tremendous. Um, and I think we're on a long journey of trying to understand the, the boundary of decisions that are best made algorithmically and, and decisions that are just best made by humans. And, you know, this is, you know, maybe the best example, the, the simplest examples in the case of a stylist working with algorithms to choose things for clients, but this actually pervades our whole business where we have algorithms that help decide what inventory to buy and you know, how to structure orders with vendors and how to, um, you know, how, how to, to, to um, run a paid marketing program. And so there, there's this, this dance of humans and machines throughout the business. And I think that's actually a thing we'll see playing out certainly more across the retail industry, but I think across, you know, you know, the, the economy at large. And the, the message I, I, I like to take from it is that, you know, despite all the kind of uh, dystopian concern about the robots are coming and the self-driving cars, I think, uh, you know, there's actually, you know, a future of humans and machines working together where work gets better and you can actually use algorithms to allow humans to do things they wouldn't be able to do themselves. And the intent is to just make humans better rather than to replace them. So how does it work when the algorithms can take on more complex tasks or things mm -hmm. that you would leave up to your humans because they were better able to do that? What, how, how do you not frighten away <laughs> your stylists or your inventory managers or your buyers? Um, mm -hmm. you know, or you know, how do you also you know, encourage them to get different skills and retrain on different things that they're going to have to accommodate as they're freed up to do something that's a lot more interesting. So I, I, I think in thinking about 
uh, thinking about the balance of arts and science, I like to think of there being a spectrum. So there, there's some problems that you know are really very scientific. Like for one example, for us is you know allocating inventory across different warehouses. Like is a fairly well posed optimization problem. Like it's you can approach it very algorithmically, and there's always edge cases and some human involvement. But on the spectrum, like it's pretty pretty algorithmic, and then. Um, you know, there, there's other things that, that have a lot more art in them. Um, so, you know, deciding like what is the best trend going to be, you know, next season for us, you know, working in fashion is you know an important question to think about. And while there are quantitative approaches to that, there's a lot of art in people who go to fashion shows and are just understanding trends and, and figuring out what that is. And the reality is that most of the problems that we work on are somewhere in the middle, um, and that's where where it's really interesting. Um, you know, with, with a buyer or a planner or thinking about, you know, creating an assortment of inventory that clients are going to love, um, you know, there, there's some art and making sure that, you know, that has the right stylistic profile and the right freshness to it. Um, but there's also, you know, an algorithmic component where we can say a lot about, you know, much as you might compose a portfolio of stocks or bonds, you can think about composing a portfolio of blouses that's going to delight, you know, the future clients. Um, if you, clients and future fixes. Um, and so you, creating tools that allow humans to, to leverage algorithms without uh, removing their discretion um, where, where it is still quite important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, privacy is mm -hmm. really top of mind, certainly in California with mm -hmm. CCPA coming out. We all have to think about, well, how do we still personalize and create great experiences without being too creepy or stepping on our, you know, on our private spaces. So. You know, what goes into that aspect of trusting the algorithm, of governing those algorithms and the deployment of those algorithms so that you can still scale and get the most out of it, but, you know, still maintain that trust and, you know, not have the regulator breathing down your back? It's, it's a great question. So I think actually Stitch Fix has this, this wonderful alignment of incentives between our clients and the business where clients really want to share with us um, and you know, are just effusive in doing so. So something like 85% of clients leave feedback with, you know, when, whenever we send them shipment, even though they don't have to. Um, and clients are you know, generally excited to share with us. And that's fundamentally because they want us to get to know them and serve them better in, in, the, in the future. Um, and also because our business model um, is well aligned with that trust as well. So our, what we really are trying to do is get to know people and, and you know, be able to personalize a service toward them um, and you know, not, not to sell data or to, to monetize it in different ways. And, and that really creates a flywheel of feedback where people are you know, more and more excited about us getting to know them, and that feedback, of course, powers a lot of our whole business. So when you when you say that, well, this this shirt was a little too big or too small, we learn something about your preferences and how you like things to fit. Um, if if we send a shirt to a thousand people and nine hundred say that it's too big or too small, we're starting to learn something about the shirt. And so having having that feedback coming back from clients who are you know fundamentally trying to improve their own experience actually improves the experience of others, and all of that at the lowest level is built on trust and actually wanting to share information, which, which is, you know, in a lot of contrast to, um, you know, other platforms. Uh, it is worth noting, so we, so we launched our, our first international expansion into the UK this year. Part of that uh, was uh, working on GDPR. Um, and yes. so, you know, certainly we, we think a lot uh, in terms of a platform and, and being able to, um, you know, really ensure, um, you know, that, that, that we can even exceed compliance with GDPR is, it was a significant engineering investment and you know a priority for us. Yeah, um, it really sounds like it. It starts with you have a corporate value mm -hmm. around your customer and you've built that value to extend it so that your customers do trust you. It really does come down to that. It starts there. Absolutely. Thinking about it. It's a very sincerely client-focused company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that trust brings about some interesting opportunities. I mean, as much as you're, you know, algorithmically driven, it's really about the data. You've mentioned that quite mm -hmm. a bit. Obviously, we're talking about that as well, um, you know, from an AI perspective. Um, how do you take that relationship and get to know your customers better? Like, how do you game your data? It's not casino, I promise. <laughs> Yeah, so I think uh, the, the, the traditional way that a client would interact with Stitch Fix is you sign up and you fill out a profile that, that lets us learn about your style preferences, how much you like to spend, how you like things to fit, 
Um, and that gives us a lot of information to help get started. And then over time, as we send you things, you provide feedback. And so we you know, continue to get to know you better and better. Um, but even for you know, a, a, a client who receives frequent shipments, you, know, you, get a, you get a shipment with five things, and you know, maybe a month or two later, you want another one. Um, you know, the, the pace of learning is kind of limited by the, the rate at which we're sending you things. And so one thing that we found tremendously successful over the past year um, is something that, that we call style shuffle, which is essentially a rating game. Um, Not in, a dance. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> in our, a yep. <laughs> in um, our, our mobile application. And basically, it, it's a way for people to rate things, whether they like the style or not. And this data has proved tremendously valuable. And you know, Stitch Fix is a very data-driven empirical company, so we do experiments wherever we can. Um, and it's you know, very significantly improved you know, client experience with um, uh, you know, how, how things fit and how they look and just generally, you know, liking the service better as we better elicit their preferences. One thing that we've really, you know, been, been the, delighted to see is that um, while we initially thought about this as a better way to get to know clients and, and to get, you know, get to learn their preferences, it's actually pretty fun. Um, and people actually will, will spend a lot of time rating, you know, sometimes many, many hundreds or thousands of, of, of items. And, uh, you know, this, of course, you know, helps us get to know them. Um, and that, that, that trove of data has really been very valuable for us um, across many areas of our business from how to recommend things to you, to how to pick a stylist for you when, when you first come to the service. And uh, you know, I think it, uh, it's given us a way to engage with clients outside of the, the typical uh, fix flow that, that previously mm -hmm. dominated. So you have this new channel to capture better information to use in a variety of different ways. Like, you, you kind of intuitively jumped into it. It was a hunch, let's try this out. How do you take that experiment and start understanding how to bring that back in and making it a corporate asset to your company. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, so. So now that now that we have this platform, this way of engaging with clients, uh, you know, we we have a lot of people thinking about what is the best way to engage with clients, and there's this interesting balance of you know trying to make it a fun experience, so you know, it's an engagement tool, having people you know, want to return to the app and a way to stay connected to Stitch Fix, um, but also providing you know, data that, that is informative and useful. And sometimes those things are, are at odds with one another. So you can imagine like if you're rating things, uh, people tend to like to see things that they like when they're, when they're rating things. And so algorithms that would show you things that like kind of demonstrate that we're learning your style, people tend to like that. Um, on the other hand, it's actually quite valuable to have people say that they don't like things. I mean, quite valuable to show people, you know, polarizing inventory uh, to, to better understand the types of clients who would like it. And to create, you know, the best experience for clients, uh, you, have to, you have to think about balancing those things. So that, you know, in itself becomes kind of, a, you know, an algorithmic subfield at, at Stitch Fix of, you know, what is the content that we, you know, we, we put through Style Shuffle and how do we, how do we create that, that balance of learning about people um, and also, you know, providing a fun experience. Surprised you this year? So I think uh, the uh, so we've been talking about the, the style shuffle rating game. I think the the extent to which that that tool and the data, in particular the data that's generated, has permeated the entire business is something that has exceeded my you know my my, my <laughs> expectations. And I think it's it's a uh, it's, it's kind of a fun case study really for the way that data flows through the business and. Um, and you know, as we think about other ways to learn about clients, um, I think one of the interesting things about having you know such a, a strong data science organization and so many algorithmic capabilities in the business, as we get better information about what people like, it can just kind of flow through into all the different applications and help improve the way that we buy inventory and help improve the way that we think about segmenting clients for marketing. And there's a lot of um, uh, kind of automatic benefits to, to bringing in more data like that. And I think the degree to which that um, uh, has become successful has certainly been a surprise. Yeah. Great. Well, I want to thank you. I thank think we you. have one more minute. Can we get one or two questions in? Is that good? All right. Fantastic. Does anybody have questions for Brad? Um, you talked briefly about size and how you incorporate that in. Can you touch more on that? Absolutely. So uh, 
as I'm sure everybody here knows, size and fit are among the most important things when, when choosing to, to buy something to wear. And so we, we focus a lot on how to, how to predict what people are going to like and how to, how to have inventory that's going to allow us to do that. And so um, you know, when, when people can provide feedback like this is too big or too small, we, we can start to learn about them. Um, in aggregate, that feedback can allow us to do things like uh, among, so Stitch Fix has a number of exclusive brands, which is inventory that's actually you know created for us to, to our specifications. And you can imagine, you know, once you start to have this kind of feedback generated by people, you close something of an evolutionary feedback loop. So, so um, you know, one great example um, is that, you know in our men's business, you know, we we found that the way that people were rating shirts suggested that we should change the basic fit block that we use to to create a lot of those styles and using. Um, you know, some algorithms that extracted the, the, the feedback, we were able to just, you know, make all the inventory better and lead to a very significant improvement in the way that people rate things. And so um, we really think about it through learning through feedback and, and um, tr trying to make inventory better and do a better job sending things to people. It's been fun. Um, while this is, you know, certainly a core challenge in our, our men's and women's businesses, it's a, it's a tremendous challenge in our kids' business, which which is one of our, our newer businesses, where the sizes of what is a toddler size varies dramatically across brand, and so it takes quite a bit of work actually to figure out like, well, how do you you know register those all to some some scale that we can use to to, to know what to send people. Well, everybody, let's give a hand for oh for Brad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.